Welcome to Mobile One The Grid. Coming up today, we get set for the 100th Indy 500 and celebrate 50 years of McLaren in Formula One. We begin today's Mobile One The Grid at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where America's most fabled race is about to get underway. With crowds of over 400,000 worldwide TV coverage and Super Bowl-style pageantry, the Indianapolis 500 is the greatest spectacle in racing, and this year marks its 100th running. 33 drivers will line up for the biggest race on the 2016 calendar, and a chance to feel the elation that only comes with winning at Indy. It's a career-changing, life-changing event. It's every goal I had as a kid. It's my life, childhood dream, and, and that was the reason that I start racing, and it's still the reason that I race. Great job. You're now a winner of the Indianapolis 500, my friend. Since Ray Haroon won the first 500 in 1911, the race has grown in significance often producing the crowning moment of a career and always making household names of its winners. And the winner of the Indianapolis 500 is Juan Pablo Montoya. This one goes when people are all 15 years, it took you 15 years, it really didn't. It, it was my third try, you know, to win again. So I've been lucky enough that I, you know, I spent some time in Formula 1, I spent some time in Oscar and I'm back in IndyCar and, you know, I'm loving every minute of it. When you win the Indy 500, you're automatically inducted into a certain club. You know, you're an Indy 500 winner. And for the rest of your life, you'll be introduced that way. Very rarely am I introduced as the IndyCar champion, Ryan and Ray. It's more Indy 500 champion. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway, or Brickyard, is one of the most demanding circuits in the world. With its nine degree banking and half mile straightaways, speeds top 220 miles per hour, and there's no room for error. In 200 laps, a lot of things can happen and sometimes can turn around like in the split of a second. So just never give up during the race. I think it's, it's the key. There is so many things that can go wrong, but so only few things to go right. With a phenomenal team like Team Penske, the odds increase tremendous. But still, you, you got to be there in the end. To finish first, first you got to finish. While Tony Kanaan took 12 years to conquer the brickyard, Elio Castroneves won at his first attempt. But whether you're a seasoned veteran or an Indy rookie, 2016 is a chance to go down in history. For me, any Indy 500, my first one would be special, but to be in the 100th running for my first time is just, uh, you know, an added bonus. To win this race any year would be, uh, you know, huge. First one with Ray Haroon, he was uh, the face for 100 years, so maybe the guy who wins the 100th is the face again. The Indianapolis 500 for me is, is the greatest event in the whole world. For those who haven't been, you got it. You have to see it. And to win the 100th would be spectacular. I mean, I don't even know what to say. It would be amazing. Should Elio Castro Neves win, the Brazilian would make history of his own, giving team owner Roger Penske an unrivaled 17th success while joining AJ Foyt, Al Unzer, and Rick Mears as a four-time winner. No question, the hundredth, it's mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a history. But in the end of the day, <laughs> no matter what year, it's 99, 101, 102, winning this race, trust me, you're going to be extremely happy. <laughs> Next, we find out how Corvette Racing have been using the IMSA series in the U.S. to get set for the biggest endurance race in the world. Corvette Racing have won a mighty eight Le Mans class victories in just 16 attempts. And Englishman Oliver Gavin has an outstanding five of those wins. But to achieve that, it's the preparation that keeps them ahead of the pack. Le Mans is our big race of the year. It is uh, the, the pinnacle of the, of the season. It's the one where everybody's watching. It's the one where the, the pressure's the most. And you know that the whole team preparation is, is, has been focused on that one point. Winning your class at Le Mans is the ultimate sports car credential, but getting those wins take a Herculean effort. For Corvette, it's a year-round campaign. We start planning for Le Mans the minute we get back from the previous year's Le Mans. We're already back at the shop now, loading up crates, 
immediately following Laguna, the cars will get prepped, they'll get put on an airplane along with 22 tons of additional equipment, and that'll get flown over. And then the guys will come over. And then we're gonna have to unload all that stuff and get our whole little city built in Le Mans. Logistics for the Le Mans trip is one thing, but it's also crucial to learn from the opening rounds of the IMSA sports car season. You're trying to take the building block of Daytona and understand what we've learned from the car there, whether it's aerodynamically or mechanically or with the tyres that we've run, and then pass that on into Sebring. So all of these are vital parts of that building process. Usually we also have an endurance test or a test that's specific for Le Mans because none of these places, well, Daytona comes closest to how you would run at Le Mans, but still not quite. We'll have one test where we run exactly how we think we're going to run. But we use every race, every lap that we do, we try and get better knowledge of the car, try and find little things that will help us somehow at Le Mans. The data taken from Daytona and then Sebring develops an aero package suited to the circuit de la Sarte. Everything we do all year long is building for Le Mans. There's always objectives and lessons learned that just build up to what we do at Le Mans. Daytona is interesting because it's quite a different track than anything we race on in the States. And it's the only place we operate in the States where you're running a low downforce package. And we don't have the Le Mans Aero Kits at Daytona. That's a FIA, IMSA difference in regulations, but we're running the car very trimmed out. All the setup work and tuning around that is pretty uh, significant. The structure of the team allows the different departments to focus on car development before coming together at race weekend. We divided our groups up into subsets. We have an engine engineering group, we have a chassis engineering group, and then obviously we have the crew guys. Before any event, these guys each get their program assembled and together. And then we hold a joint discussion, looking at what we're going to be doing. The engineers need the engine data so that they can make the proper gear selections. Then the chassis engineers relay that information down to the technician side. So they're able to build and install the transmissions with that gear set in. Then after each session, every aspect is looked at and reevaluated. The engine guys will look at engine performance, they'll make suggestions to the chassis guys, the chassis guys get that information back. So that's our formula that we use really at every event in order to ensure the fact that what we put on the racetrack is going to give the drivers a car that's consistent throughout the entire event. For Corvette Racing, 16 years experience at Le Mans and the lessons learned are what give them the advantage come June in France. We know that our biggest competition is looking to do exactly the same thing. So it's vital that you take on all of those lessons that you've learned from all of those races and apply them for Le Mans. Because if you don't, you're going to come unstuck. We celebrate 50 years of McLaren in Formula One now as Jensen Button is put to the test by an old friend. 2016 sees Jensen Button's seventh season with McLaren Honda and a place he calls home. But how well does he know the team's long history? Who better to put him to the test than former McLaren driver David Coulthard, who drove 150 races for the team from 1995 to 2004. So, Jensen. Yes. International racing star, former world champion. You've got motorsports in your DNA. McLaren are your favourite team, even before you drove for them. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, absolutely right. So to prove that fact, we okay. have a, a number of questions here to yeah. really understand your knowledge okay. of the McLaren Formula 1 team. The car today is predominantly grey. Yep. Which colour was it in its very first Grand Prix, 1966, Monte Carlo? Orange. We all know that orange McLaren is originally orange. So why did you hesitate before answering it? Because I wanted it. Dun, dun, dun. Ah. Does he know the answer? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay, well, people were really panicking at home there. Moving on. Who won McLaren's last Grand Prix of the 70s? Watson? No, I'll oh. give you one more chance for half a point. <laughs> he, was, he was a bit of a 70s. legend. Oh, um, James Hunt. Yeah. John Watson? I don't know. <laughs> And I wasn't born. We not? No. McLaren have won uh, the most amount of races consecutively at Monte Carlo. Do you know, um, and it was six in a row by the way, do you know which years they were between when they won six in a row? It was from 86 to 92. <laughs> 
Well, first of all, that would have been seven. <laughs> but zero. Or eight. It was actually 88 to 93. That was close. That is a good long stint, isn't, yeah, it? isn't it? I think I'll give you half a point for that. Which McLaren drivers have won the World Championship under Ron Dennis, so during his era? There are five drivers. Well, let's go back to the early days. Um, 80s. Alan Prost. Correct. Ayrton Senna. Correct. Did you say five? Yes. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mika. Correct. Lewis. Mm -hmm. That's four. So you're missing just one person. There's one. Nicky Lauda. Correct. Uh -huh. You can give it this. Uh, well, this is very easy because it's so few. Um, how many wins did I have in my uh, time at McLaren? Well, I know this because I remember when I got 13 wins, I was excited. But I had more than you. <laughs> okay. Uh, 12. 12, correct. Well done. Right. Which driver has the most wins for McLaren? And I'll give you a clue. It's not you. Is it you? No. <laughs> uh, wow. It's either Alan or Ayrton. Um, I'll, go Ayrton. I'll go Ayrton. Correct. This is back to you because yeah. we want you to feel involved. Part of in this. Uh, how many podiums have you scored for McLaren? Okay. Not for the other teams that you may uh, have represented. I've scored 50 podiums in total and I know that but strangely, half of them are with McLaren, so 25. Correct. Not only does he know the answer, he can do math as well. Let's see. And uh, that concludes, do you know McLaren? So technically, you only got one wrong, as far as I'm calling it. How, How many of them do you think Ron would have got right? Yeah, I think he would have dropped a few. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, mate. Well That's done. Good. Congratulations. After the break, Jensen Button talks Monaco. And we meet the man who's both Mr. Le Mans and Mr. Sebring. Welcome back to Mobile One The Grid. Time now to meet arguably the most accomplished sports car driver of all time. The Great Dane Tom Christensen is well known as Mr. Le Mans, and rightly so with a breathtaking six consecutive victories and possibly an unreachable nine in total. But he is also fondly recognised in North America as Mr. Seabury. For me, always the first race of the season. It's hot, sunny Florida. The circuit is tough and it's grueling when you get into the sunset and the grip really comes down with the rubber on the concrete as it builds up over the week. Over the years with Audi, Sebring become a circuit which where you developed and you made sure that you had that durability of a race car. And sometimes after the 12 hours, we simply just put it in the tents and we came back the next uh, morning or Monday morning and we would then do another 12 or 24 hours on the cars again. That was, that was something nice to have experienced and, and to have been a part of. Christensen's passion for racing is unquestionable and even after hanging up his race helmet in 2014, he still has words of wisdom for the old World War II Air Force Base. Sebring Circuit was speaking about that as Le Mans. They have to be careful not to change too much because they should stale just like they are and just take good care of them. There's far too many circuits who are developed into too clinical, too ba ba ba. But the drivers want it like this. They they like it like these. That's why they love to do well at, at races like Sebron and Le Mans, or at least I can say that has been for my career. In sports car racing, you're only as good as the teammates around you. And with Alan McNish and Dindo Capello alongside, they open the floodgates for an era of Audi dominance. Tom and I drove together many times and with Dindo Capello we were teammates and they actually started here. It started the discussions in 05 because Tom and I duked it out in the champion Audi R8. I have been blessed with great teammates which in the cars over the years were coming in with that not only the passion but also the determination, concentration and respect in that uh, you need to, to win race. You can never overdo it. You need to push it but not overdo it and that is always a fine line. With Tom and I we spent so many hours away from the circuit. Also I have to say with Indo Capello because Dindo at the beginning especially when he was still racing 
he was, you know, the one that I would have said gelled the two of us together and made that, uh, that little triumvirate. We didn't always win, but we always had a fantastic time and and we, we had the bad luck, the good luck, the great racing and the great atmosphere uh, over, over the years. Tom Christensen's sixth victory saw him inducted into the Sebring Hall of Fame this year. Not only was he added to a prestigious list of names like Sterling Moss and Derek Bell, but the Great Dane even had a corner named after him. It's absolutely correct that he's inducted into the Hall of Fame here in Sebring, alongside some pretty excellent drivers, but without doubt, TK's one of them. They pulled my leg to name turn three, Christensen Corner. That's something which um, you don't expect things like that. But as a race car driver, there, there's nothing better, you know. I mean, it makes me even, ah, in a way, I want to go back racing. It would be nice to go in the car down turn one, into turn one. It's blind, you know, it took fifth gear. You maybe drop to about kilometers, maybe to 230, 240. Go through, you, you know, the last bump. You, you have to keep some throttle, but not full and not off because it's kicking out. And then you come down to the next corner, you can just radio. I'm just about to break for Christensen Corner. That would be fantastic to tell you the team like that, but hey, you go. I'm, I'm fortunate and very happy to have that. And it's a corner I actually, I have made mistakes at, so I don't know if that's why, but I mean, turn three is, is very important. We continue reflecting on 50 years of McLaren in F1 now as Jensen Button and his race engineer Tom Stallard talk Monaco. It's as big an occasion on the social calendar as it is on the sporting one. The Monaco Grand Prix is a race through the heart of the Principality on a 3.3 kilometer street circuit. It remains the jewel in the crown of Formula One and a race that the McLaren team has won a record 15 times since their maiden F1 race back in 1966. Monaco is the standout glamorous race on the calendar. You know, people are watching from massive yachts, they're watching from the grandstand, watching from balconies. And to drive, it's spectacular. There's no room for error around Monaco. A lot of the new circuits, you have these big runoff areas, which I'm fine with. But Monaco is a circuit that's never really changed. You are on the edge the whole time when you're pushing the car. And it's a great feeling. It's a very different challenge for the engineering team, too. Prepping a 21st century racing thoroughbred for a race seemingly locked in time. But there's a number of things that make Monaco unique. It's a lot narrower, a lot slower, a lot more bumpy and a lot more challenging for the driver than most of the circuits. That affects the way we set up the car, so the Monaco setup is, is completely unique. We have as much downforce on the car as we can, where the car has to be very soft to ride the bumps, ride the curbs. The other big difference is that traffic can completely have you over in Monaco in qualifying and in practice, so traffic management becomes really important. And uh, trying to find a clear gap on the track is a huge part of the race engineer's job that he can really help the driver with. But ultimately, it's a race where an F1 star can shine, where skill and bravery are tested to the limit. The driver's cornering almost continuously. He's generally going within 50 millimeters of the walls quite regularly, which is an incredible skill. Judging the corners, there's, there's no room for error, whereas a lot of the circuits you can run six inches wide at the exit and you might be hampered a little bit as you run onto the Astro turf. If you do that in Monaco, then you're in the armco. I wouldn't want more than one Monaco on the calendar a year, but when you go there, there's a lot of adrenaline when you step into the car because you know one slip up and you're in the wall. And that's why when you watch a lap by Ayrton Senna in the 80s when he qualified on pole by one and a half seconds in front of Prost, it's just madness when you watch that. And from the stories I've heard, he stepped out of the car and said, that's enough before the end of qualifying because he knew he was going to hit the wall, which he did actually do in the race. McLaren have been very successful around Monaco. Good friend of mine, DC, won there twice, which is mega. I've never won with McLaren. I've been on the podium, um, but uh, hopefully that will come in the future. We wrap up today's show with sports car racing and a look at the partnership between two sons of F1 greats. Rebellion Racing have been part of the World Endurance Championship since its inception in 2012. In their bid to defend the LMP1 privateer title, they paired regular driver Nicola Prost with another great name from Formula One's heyday. For me it's a great opportunity, you know, it's a, it's a very fast car, 
It's a little MT1 car, so for me it's, it's great to be back in a car that has a lot of power. The guys are a lot of fun to work with, they're very relaxed, and it's not a very uh, crazy schedule. For me, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity just to get used to the championship and the races and then the formats, basically. Even though their fathers were famous Formula 1 rivals, the new teammates are sharing the number 12 R1 for the first three races of the season, culminating at Le Mans. 30 years ago, uh, uh, they fought for the title. Now, I mean, Nels is a good friend. We've known each other for a long time. Now, I think I'm really happy to have him uh, as a teammate. You know, there was never a problem between my dad and his dad. They were good friends, so no, it's quite funny to be together. We have uh, a bit in common, and uh, it's, it's great to share a car with him. It's always great to share a car with not only good drivers, but also nice people. Once in a while, he'll throw a comment, oh, my dad hates this, and I'll we'll start talking a little bit about it. Sometimes it just happens when we're remembering things that they said or we're giving different examples of how we are compared to them and stuff like that. Formula E regular PK has had to adapt quickly to the power of the R1's V6 turbo engine and the massive grip of the new Dunlop tyres specifically designed for the non-hybrid class. The car is amazing. The car is uh, really fast. Obviously, Ricard over here is, uh, is a very fast track, you know, a lot of grip on some of the corners, so uh, my neck is, is feeling it for sure a little bit. It's been a while since I haven't driven a car with so much G-force, so uh, now it's pretty really fun to be able to get at the end of the straights at 3.30 kilometers an hour. It's, last time I think I reached that speed was only in the airplane probably. The tires uh, look uh, to suit our car better, you know, Michelin did a, a fantastic job for us, but uh, they went more in the direction of the hybrid, which became a bit difficult for us to handle, so the Dunlop is a uh, more to do to our car, and I think we can uh, gain quite a lot with this. Third and fourth place finishes for their two cars in the first two races of the season bodes well for the team retaining their class title. But next up, it's Le Mans, and Prost is planning a famous send-off for his teammate. Endurance Racing has some fantastic events like Sebring, Petit Le Mans and Le Mans. So it's just special for me being French. Uh, I think it would be fantastic to win uh, with Nelson to have Piquet and Prost on the first uh, step on the podium at Le Mans. The main goal over here is, is to really learn, you know, finish the races. We seem to be the quickest in our class. So uh, it, would be, uh, it would be an honor to share a, a World Championship trophy with him. Next time, we look at the runners and riders at this year's Le Mans and go in search of the perfect Formula One pit stop. Meanwhile, join us on YouTube, Twitter and our all-new website for our coverage of the 100th Indy 500 and to hear more from David Coulthard and Jensen Button. MobileOneTheGrid.com is your home of motorsport online. See you next time.